and welcome to the travel show from Manchester Airport. Last weekend, whilst a record number of people headed for foreign hotspots, back home, gales, floods and torrential rain marked a miserable end to one of the wettest Augusts this century. Tonight, we look at the plight of recession-hit hotel owners on the English Riviera, who've experienced their worst summer ever. Also tonight, Paddy Haycox heads for the fashionable Portuguese resort of Estoril and its cultural capital, Lisbon. Carol Smiley goes over the sea to Sky and enjoys a highland fling with that archetypal Scotsman Andy Stewart. And Matthew Collins faces a DIY challenge, building a coracle on the banks of the River Severn in Shropshire. But first, our foreign report. And this week, Paddy Haycox has been to the wealthy coastal resort of Estoril in Portugal and sampled the portent culture of Lisbon. Many British people think of a holiday in Portugal in terms of the Algarve, but the most popular destination for the Portuguese themselves is this stretch of the Estoril coast, just a 30-minute train ride from Lisbon. Traditionally, it was the home chosen by exile and royalty, but what does it have to offer today? Estoril is largely a smart residential resort with few shops. The beach is clean, but like most of the adjoining beaches, it's very small. The only exception is at Carcavelos, a few miles south, but you might not be happy about sharing the sand with the many carefree dogs we saw here. Happily, worries about the quality of seawater and general pollution levels have prompted the local authorities to address the problem. But if your idea of a beach is something more rugged and open, then you'd have to consider travelling further afield. This is Gincho, a 20-minute drive up the coast. It's certainly bigger, and the sea is much cleaner. Just a few kilometres from Estoril is the busy fishing village of Kashkaish. There are beaches here too, but it has other attractions. It's picturesque, and you'll find several cafes and restaurants tucked away in the cobbled side streets. According to local legend, a fisherman from here discovered America ten years before Columbus. But then in every corner of the globe there's a place that'll lay claim to that. All too often the travel brochures liberally describe places as pretty little fishing villages. But here at Kashkaish you can literally follow the fish off the boats along the quay and into the daily fish auction. This auction is a little different from most. The prices start high and drop until there's a buyer. Just around the corner, there's activity of a very different kind. This is Portugal's equivalent of Crufts. It's an international dog show, which, believe it or not, is held every year here in Kashkais. But it's only held over one weekend, so if you're a dog lover, you'd better plan ahead. Me? I'm just taking the dog for a walk. Come on, free food. The great thing about this area is the wide range of sporting and leisure facilities that are available. I've come to Quinta da Marinha where I found something that suits me down to a T. There's also plenty for the more energetic. Go Meanwhile, in the evenings, the bright lights of Estoril draw the crowds. When it comes to nightlife, this slice of Las Vegas come to downtown Estoril has to be the main attraction. The casino is one of the biggest in Europe, and it's well known to jet-setters and tourists alike. If you fancy a flutter here, the team name, of course, because the management is anxious to protect the privacy of its customers, so we'll never know who are the losers or the winners. Or if you're a big player, you could come in here to the gaming room and try and double your pocket money. A particular attraction of the casino is the nightly show, which has featured names like Tom Jones, Diana Ross and Dionne Warwick. Tonight, it's Mozart.
One of the most popular excursions inland is to the mountain village of Sintra. Founded by the Romans as a place for moon worship, it's been adopted in more recent years by a range of artists and writers who've sought inspiration here, including our own Lord Byron. And this is just the place to sit and relax in one of the many cafes and restaurants and enjoy a cup of coffee and a speciality of this village, a local confection made of cinnamon and cheese called Sintra Cake. Sintra has regal connections too. Many royal families have spent their summers here. And what better way to arrive at this palace now converted to a five-star luxury hotel. And if you feel like splashing out, a double room will cost you here £160 per night in high season. Whilst most Portuguese holidaymakers on the coast have escaped from Lisbon, as a British tourist you ought to see the capital. At the height of Portugal's colonial power in the 16th century, Lisbon was known as the City of Discoveries. It was one of the most important ports in the world, and there are many monuments and buildings to its distinguished past. One of the best ways of seeing the sights of this city is by tram. They were built pre-war, they're a particularly distinctive feature, and they conjure up memories of a bygone era. You can go anywhere in the city for a set fare of 60 pence. This is the monastery of St. Geronimus, built in 1502. The cloisters in particular are a major tourist attraction and are reckoned to be amongst the most beautiful in the world. Now, if you buy a postcard of Lisbon, it'll almost certainly have on it a picture of this place. This is the Torre de Belle, just a few minutes' walk from the Monastery of St. Geronimus. It's a fortress built in 1512 to protect against enemies from the sea. And as recently as 340 years ago, it was used as a prison. The highest point in the city is the Castle of saint George, from where you really can take in a spectacular view. You could hardly come to Portugal without acknowledging that it's the home of port production. Here, at the Port Wine Institute, there are over 200 varieties, and the price ranges from a couple of pounds to 120 pounds a bottle. I confess I'm not an expert. How do I tell a good port? You must uh, see uh, the colour of the wine. It's very important, the colour. You must smell also. You must see their body, and after you must taste. That's the most important part, isn't it? Yes, the taste. Mm. The Alfama district is the oldest part of Lisbon. It's one of a number of very distinct areas that you can explore, and a stroll around here will leave you in no doubt that this is still a working city. At night, here, as in most parts of Lisbon, you can enjoy traditional Portuguese entertainment. A traditional dinner here, like this dish of clams and pork, will set you back around eight or nine pounds. This local bottle of wine is four pounds. But what's really special is the after-dinner entertainment known as fado. Fado means fate, and the songs are invariably nostalgic. <laughs> To me, the most important is to sing and to receive from, from all the people, the, the clubs, only that. It's in your soul, man. Yes.
If you're looking for a mixed holiday, this part of Portugal could be for you. Sporting activities are widespread, and although the resort beaches around Estoril are small, there are more extensive stretches of sand further up the coast. Meanwhile, there's plenty to explore, both inland and here in the historic capital city of Lisbon, which remains unblemished by skyscrapers and high-tech developments, and has managed to retain its special period feel. So, some facts about Portugal. A typical two-week package to Estoril costs £580 half board, or you could take a one-week city break to Lisbon for £465. Flights to Lisbon take about two and a half hours. A meal at a restaurant costs about £9 a head, a bottle of wine £4. Port starts at £5 a bottle. Transport. Car hire is approximately £22 a day. Trams are cheap, about 60 pence per journey. A round of golf costs between £10 and £25. Tennis is from £3.75 an hour. Entrance to the casino Paddy visited is £1.60 and opens from 3pm to 3am. If you'd like to stay in the Setaish Palace in Sintra, prices start at £100 per person per night. And if you fancy a free holiday in Portugal, now's your chance in our weekly competition. The question is, what product comes from the Douro region of Portugal? There's another clue in the current edition of BBC Holidays magazine. Or for an entry form, send a stamped addressed envelope to Portugal Travel Show Competition, BBC Holidays, PO Box 1, Hastings, East Sussex, TN35, 4TJ. Back at home, last weekend, gales, torrential rain and raging seas turned the bank holiday into one of the worst on record, driving yet another nail into the coffin of hoteliers who found themselves sandbagging their doorways instead of counting hope for takings. British seaside towns are already in financial crisis. The combined effect of the recession and cheap foreign packages has meant that the number of holidaymakers has halved in some resorts and hundreds of hotels have gone out of business. So I went to have a look at the situation for myself. This is Torquay on the English Riviera. It's one of the worst hit resorts. And the terrible weather over the last few weeks has been the final straw for some people. I don't think I'm going to come anymore to Torquay. Because, you know, weather-wise and things like that, you think, you know, it's just a waste of money. It's been such a terrible year this year with the weather, with the summer, and I think it's, people take these last-minute holidays abroad. Things are so bad here that up to 70 hotels are faced with receivership. But the crisis has meant that holidaymakers can virtually name their price for accommodation. This year they've done a special deal for us where one of the children go free, and they haven't done that in the past, so it was quite a good deal this year. We contacted 30 hotels in Torquay. Everyone offered discounts of at least 20% and several hotels were prepared to halve their rates. I've got one or two friends who um, basically people have arrived on the door, they've seen the price and, uh, and they've said, well, look, we can go cheaper elsewhere. And rather than have a, have a bedroom empty, they're obviously open to negotiation. Normally, each year we'd increase the tariff by approximately inflation. So instead of putting it up 5% this year, we've actually lowered it 20%. And another thing that we're doing is we normally don't introduce our winter tariff until the beginning of November. This year we're introducing our winter tariff on the 15th of September. It's not just Torquay. In Blackpool, hotels and guest houses are cutting prices drastically, with some rooms available for just £6 a night. And in Newquay, where trade has halved, one hotelier has even offered to drive customers to and from the resort free of charge. But bargain deals don't necessarily stop the businesses from going under. And now, in many cases, the hotels are being run not by the original owners, but by the receivers. There are a number of hotels in receivership. I think that's common knowledge. Uh, it's been exacerbated by high interest rates, by poor weather, unfortunately, this year. And it's really across the board that hotels are suffering now. We have the larger hotels with so much cost of maintaining their hotel are having to find uh, dig deep into their reserves. It's that middle band of hotels where perhaps 16 to 25, 16 to 30 bedrooms that have had to, uh, had to find the difficult answers that are necessary now. You've got to continuously improve. From our point of view, 10 years ago, a shower was an optional extra. Then showers became compulsory. Now it's got to be a thermostatic shower. Now you've got to have 
television with remote control. You've got to have hair dryers, trouser presses, and many, many other facilities. And if you haven't got these sort of things, the customer is going to go elsewhere. The British seaside holiday is part of the British way of life, but I can see a situation where not enough money is going back into the hotel to make those facilities that people now uh, demand. A gloomy outlook for the traders and an uncertain future for the tourists. But in the meantime, there are plenty of bargains, so shop around. And from the English Riviera to the west coast of Scotland. For this week's British report, Carol Smiley has been to visit the most popular Hebridean island, the Isle of Skye. to find out what Scotland's really like then head for the Isle of Skye and this is the way most people find their first glimpse of the island on the five minute ferry crossing from Kyle in the West Highlands. It's been called the winged isle because of its shape, the misty isle because of its weather. With its wild coastline, mountains and moors, Skye's the most popular Hebridean island with visitors and the easiest to get to. I can't imagine anyone better to meet me than Mr Scotland himself, Andy Stewart the man whose Highland swagger has melted many a heart. Hello, Carl. Hi. Welcome to Skye. <laughs> Cape me the culture, as we see here. Have you organised the weather? I'm impressed. I have, isn't it wonderful? It's yes, really. It's <laughs> terrific. The best way to see Skye is to drive, and the roads are better than in any other parts of the Highlands. On the 30-mile journey from Kailakan to Portree, the island's capital, you skirt round the Coolants, the dramatic mountain ranges that sweep straight from the sea to heights of over 3,000 feet. These pinnacles and ridges provide a backdrop to some of Skye's most spectacular views, and they are a paradise for hill walkers and mountaineers. Most visitors use Portree as a base and it's the closest Skye gets to a metropolis with plenty of places to stay and the island's only cash dispensers. What most visitors to Portree Harbour don't realise is that some of the country's most exotic seafood is landed right here. But not much of it goes to the home market, right Alistair? Yeah, that's right Andy. Most of it goes to Spain. Uh, to the live market in Spain. They the house, British housewife doesn't stand a chance. They don't see it. They don't see it. They and they pay it. the prices that are demanded. You were saying uh, is there's a good prices to be had the for British them. British housewife wouldn't compete with the prices we get from for Spain. So you're for uh, España, old He's man? Definitely for <laughs> España. <laughs> Missed the Olympics. <laughs> Perched on the banks of a loch, proud Dunvegan Castle has long been the stronghold of one of the island's biggest clans, the MacLeods. Well, I'm very impressed by the fact that we're here in Dunvegan Castle, in the dining room, surrounded by 700 years of MacLeod history. Yeah. That's a lot of porridge. It sure is. In fact, this place feels very lived in, though. Is, is there somebody here? Oh, yes. The present chief does live here. And the history doesn't end there, because the fairy flag is also here, and the MacLeods believe if anything happens to that, they're in big trouble. Well, no wonder they look after it. <laughs> now, we're into Barbara Cartland territory here. Carol, this is really romantic. This is a lock. Bonnie Prince Charles Edward Stewart here that he presented to Flora MacDonald after she took him over the sea to sky. What could be more romantic than that? <laughs> There's plenty more to see at Dunvegan, including my favourite, a trip out onto Loch Dunvegan to see the seal colonies close up. Sky's a bit like the Scots themselves, really. At first it seems harsh, rugged and fiercely independent. But get to know it a bit better and you'll find an infinite warmth and gentle beauty. Head south and you'll find a lusher and greener sky and much more of a feel of the Gaelic culture. Here at Salmorostig College, students are taught subjects like computing and accountancy all in Gaelic and during the summer months visitors can take short courses in everything from Gaelic itself to dancing and would you believe playing the bagpipes.
right here in Skye, on the shores of Loch Harport, at Talisker Distillery, they produce a whisky that is a byword for excellence. Talisker whisky itself. Even Robert Louis Stevenson singled it out for mention. The king of drinks as I perceive it, Talisker Isla or Glenlivet. One of the prettiest places for a stroll on the island is in the lush gardens of the Clandonald Centre on the Slate Peninsula. During the summer, there are even wildlife workshops here for children. But remember, in Scotland, trees and water mean midges, and their bite is definitely worse than their buzz. So be prepared and try and bring the strongest repellents you can lay your hands on. Life here all revolves around the pub and the main topic of conversation at the moment seems to be all about plans to build a new bridge to Skye. The bridge will replace our ferry trip from Kyle to Kylakin, but it's a controversial subject among the locals. It's, it's going to take away from the scenic beauty of, the, of Kyle. Uh, but I think the, the bridge would be a, a, a tremendous benefit. For a relaxed getaway from it all holiday, it's definitely worth making the effort to cross over the sea to sky and enjoy some of its stunning scenery. But I wouldn't leave it too long if I were you, because one of the best views of the island is about to disappear forever. So, some facts about Skye. Getting there, whilst most people drive, there are daily flights to Inverness, and from there you can get a train to the Kyle of Akalsh. Coaches also run from Glasgow and Inverness to Skye. Carol visited the fishing village of Portree in the north. She then went to Dunvegan Castle and the Clan Donald Centre in the south. The ferry crossing from Kyle to Kylakin is £7.70 return. Bed and breakfast in Portree starts at £13 a night. Entrance to Dunvegan Castle costs £3.50 for adults, £3 for senior citizens and children. A boat trip to visit the seals is £2.95 for adults, £2 for children. Entrance to the Clan Donald Centre is £3 for adults, £2 for children and senior citizens. Last week, we sent Matthew Collins to Ironbridge in Shropshire to try his hand at one of the oldest traditional crafts, building a coracle. Did he make it to the regatta or was it a washout? Here's his video report. Well, this week I'm in Ironbridge in Shropshire, and my challenge is to build my own boat. I'm not going to be making a yacht, but a coracle, which is one of the oldest boats known to man. We're going to be making it from bits of wood, from canvas, and then from bitumen. Then we're going to be testing it on the water, and if we're really lucky, we're going to be taking our own boats home with us. Woodwork was never my strong point at school. Fortunately, you don't have to be an expert. These have all got to be parallel. All got to be parallel to the... Uh... Yes, yes. At the moment, they're tapering a little bit out, so just moving in slightly so that you've got it nice and level. What are you enjoying about the experience? Well, there's uh, meeting new people, and it's, it's great fun working with the wood and the tools, and running for cover every time it rains. Well, what made you come on this trip? Um, I think I wanted a boat, really, uh, rather than the woodwork. Wouldn't it have been easier just to go out and buy one? Um, I'm sure it would have been a lot easier to go out and buy one, yes. Well, although some of the people on the course stay in local B&Bs, the place does actually have its own accommodation, although I must warn you, it's almost as rudimentary... Come on, Sherwood, keep up. It's almost as rudimentary as some of the ancient tools we use. It's this way. They're like little wooden tents. Accommodation modules, we call them. And this is my one. As you can see, it's pretty basic, but it's quite comfortable as long as you bring your own sleeping bag and a camp bed is quite a good idea too. With just one piece of canvas between me and the water, I wasn't convinced my coracle would float. I think if you made a pair of Y-fronts with this, it'd last you 10 or 20 years, wouldn't it? 
last your lifetime, I should think. However, the boats weren't waterproofed yet, and a sudden downpour meant a dash for cover. Get out of the rain before it gets soaked. Coracle making requires a variety of skills, and there was definitely an art to sewing the thick canvas, although for some, just threading the needle proved a challenge. Brilliant. Success. That was a nice little stitch. Delicate little hands of mine. Right. Now you could do another one. There have been coracle makers in the Ironbridge area for centuries, and at 78, Eustace Rogers is maintaining the tradition. I can remember my grandfather being the coracle maker here. I was 10 when he died, and uh, my dad would talk about his grandfather being the coracle man. What were they used for? Well, the family used them for net fishing and uh, to evade the police when they were poaching. They used to escape the police by going down river in the coracle. Right, they'd only got to carry it from here up to the cottage where we are now, see? Well, I've finished sewing up all my pleats, and now I'm into the final stage of coracle making, putting on a coat of bitumen, which, as well as being the cheapest coating around, also makes the thing perfectly waterproof. All I've got to do now is make the handle for the paddle, fix the strap to the seat, trying to make sure I don't puncture the canvas of the coracle itself. And now we can take our own coracles out for a test. It's not even leaking yet, this. I'm going to get this back on the train. Excuse me, can I put the, um, this coracle in the guards van? I'm going to scratch the walls, over. Well, I'm finally home with my brand new coracle. Now all I've got to do is find somewhere to put it. Well, did you find a home for your coracle? Well, after depositing bitumen all over my kitchen walls and fridge, I finally put it in the garden and now it's waiting its baptism on the Thames. Tell me, apart from coracles, what do people get out of that sort of course? Well, I think a great deal of satisfaction. I mean, I certainly found it very, very mentally relaxing and therapeutic just working with the wood. But also the satisfaction comes from actually creating something, actually producing something. I mean, most people today, their jobs aren't that creative. They're just a cog in one long process. And so this coracle making, over three days when you take a few bits of wood and turn them into a boat that you can actually sail, is very fulfilling. How do people find out about it? Well, the course is operated by the Greenwood Trust, who also operate courses in chairmen making and basket making and they're based in Ironbridge so you can get details from them. Well Matthew, next week you're swapping coracles for gondolas. You're off to Venice tomorrow in time for the historic regatta that takes place at the weekend and your challenge is to take part in the medieval pageant and get yourself into a gondola on the Grand Canal. Oh well I hope I don't have to bring back my gondola to Walthamstow. <laughs> now late availabilities. Here's our roundup of some of the best British bargains on offer this week. De Vere Hotels are offering dinner, bed and breakfast for £50 per person at the Grand Hotel in Brighton throughout September, including entrance to the Leisure Club and Disco. Acorn Activities have weekend golfing breaks in Herefordshire throughout September for £100 per person, including instruction, plus farmhouse or hotel bed and breakfast accommodation. Longstaff Leisure are offering cut-price singles activity holidays for 30 to 50-year-olds at £199 for six nights full board in the Yorkshire Dales every Saturday this month. And finally, Butlin's Star Coast World in Puthelli have weekend breaks available commencing the 12th of September. Prices start from £84 for a family of four in self-catering accommodation. And that's about it for this week, except to remind you of our Moan Line number, 061 200 2999, and it's open 24 hours a day. Next week on The Travel Show, Carol Smiley heads for the Alpine Resort of Lake Constance in Germany. And Bill Oddie packs his binoculars for a spot of bird watching on the Northumbrian coast. See you next week. Bye-bye.